So it's April and you know what that means. The end of the school year is almost upon us. We get to put this whole school year behind us and finally get that well-deserved and much needed break. The finish line is in sight, but those last hundred meters can feel like an entire marathon, right? And for many years, at this time of the year, I wondered how I was going to make it to that last day of school without losing my damn mind. So in this episode, I'm diving into 10 battle-tested tips on how to not just survive, but actually thrive during this final stretch of the school year. I'm gonna be covering three different areas, gearing up for the finish line, keeping your cool, and taming the tempest. So first things first, let's talk about how to prepare for what's expected of us because there are things that you are going to be required to do at the end of the year that if you're a new teacher, you need to find out about. And if you're a seasoned teacher, you know that these are things that every year they sneak up on us because we're not preparing for them. So first, you need to focus on the essentials. The last couple of months really aren't a great time to teach new material. Your students aren't really in the mindset to absorb anything new. And can you really blame them? It's kind of like when you're in a training of some sort and it's towards the last hour or two of that training and you've pretty much checked out if you didn't check out from the beginning. So it's important to understand that students are also in this mindset. They're also looking forward to the summer. Well, most of them are. And so trying to teach them something new, especially if it's difficult, it's going to be kind of an uphill battle. This is actually the best time to be reviewing core concepts, wrapping up any loose ends in terms of what you taught them and preparing them for some upcoming end of course or final exam. So basically it's a really good time to just have them apply what they've already learned and to not try to bombard them with new things that they honestly won't remember after they leave you since it's coming so late in the year. I also tend to not like to give projects. Don't get me wrong, I've given projects before because it just seemed like a good time. It's just really like low barrier to entry because all I have to do is just give them the instructions for the project and let them do it while I get to just monitor them. However, I have found that this has actually been a nightmare scenario. A lot of times the class time that you've allotted them for projects gets interrupted by things like ceremonies or maybe testing. Plus, because it's at the end of the school year, I don't have as much time to grade it so then I'm scrambling towards the end to try to finish it. The students want feedback or their grade on that project that they work so hard on. And so it just tends to be a little bit frustrating for me at the end of the year if I have all of these projects that I have to get graded and inputted into my gradebook. Also, you might have found that if a project goes on too long, which a lot of times end of the year projects tend to do, students lose focus and start to exhibit more off task behaviors. So your plan to do something that was more engaging and easier on you actually ends up backfiring. I mean, think about it. If you have students who blast through the project quickly, what are they going to do while everybody else is finishing up? You can give them extra work, but then they're still going to goof off because now it's unfair that they get more work. They're basically being punished for getting done quickly. So you can just see that it can be difficult to manage if you give something like that towards the end of the year. So what types of things do I like to do at the end of the year? Like I mentioned before, I do like to do reviews. I like to give something that involves less of me grading. So maybe these are multiple choice things, or maybe it's something like a Kahoot or just something fun for the students to do that doesn't involve me having to grade a bunch of assignments. And then I do like group work because it keeps the kids engaged. And again, the students aren't necessarily learning something new and they can be reviewing and it's just easier for me personally to manage. So the second tip is to plan for the future. And it doesn't necessarily have to mean planning for like far out into the future. It could just be planning for the summer. So we want to start thinking about things that need to be packed up and put away for summer cleaning, or maybe you're going to be switching schools. Maybe you'll be switching grades. So you have to pack up all of your fourth grade materials because you're being moved to sixth grade, or maybe you're being moved to another classroom. So it's a good time to start planning for that now, instead of getting really stressed out, procrastinating, and even worse, having to stay into your summer so that you can get that done. Actually, what's kind of cool is you can employ your students to help you out a little bit 
During those times when they start to get restless, it can be a good time to have them help you take things down the wall or have you put things into boxes and it kind of gives them something to do, take a little bit of a mental break during those review sessions. I also encourage you to put any repair or work orders that you'd like to have completed over the summer. So maybe there's a leak somewhere that you want them to take a look at or there's a patch of carpet that they need to replace, something like that. Maybe your desk is broken or the drawer is broken and you'd like the custodians to fix it over the summer, then now would be a good time to start making a list of those so that you can give it to whoever's in charge of that. I also like to make sure that I gather all the work that I've collected and have forgotten to hand back to the students and I make a plan for that. That's actually something that you can space out over time so that during the last, say, five, 10 minutes of class when students are really losing their mind, it's a time when you can give back their papers and their work a little bit at a time so you can kill those last few minutes. My next tip is to focus on what you can control. This is actually kind of hard, even for someone like me, because we can tend to worry about all of the things that are happening. Maybe students are getting more unruly. Maybe there are still parents that are hounding you. You could be worrying about a notice of non-renewal, things like that. And so we want to try to reframe and focus on the things that are within our control so that, again, we don't lose our mind. So if you just had standardized testing and you were worried about their scores, it's out of your control now. You're not gonna find out probably until the summer how they did. So it, there's just no use in worrying about that. And if you did get a notice of non-renewal and you've already gone through the process of fighting it or discussing it with your union, if you have one and you're still going to get that, then it's time to start looking forward to the next adventure and the next opportunity for you instead of dwelling on the fact that you're not coming back. Now, I know that's a lot easier said than done, but just remember that if they don't want you there, there's gonna be a school that does and it just feels so much better to be somewhere where you're appreciated and not being criticized and hounded by your administration and other colleagues. So there are definitely better things that you can look forward to. And the same goes if you have a particularly difficult class, you know they're difficult. They've been that way the whole year. That was me and one eighth grade class. What I can control is how I react to what they're doing and the way that I structure the class period so that I can minimize how crazy they can become. So instead of dreading seeing them every single day, I just focus on how I can control and manipulate the situation to try to just keep the chaos contained as much as possible. Tip number four is to celebrate accomplishments. I personally like to take some time to acknowledge how far my students have come and how much they've grown. We think it's kind of fun to actually look back at their first piece of writing towards the beginning of the school year and just see how much better they are now. So you can do some kind of reflection piece like that, although I wouldn't take too much time because kids can get really bored with that. But you could also have some kind of celebration in class or ways to recognize your students and it's just something that kind of lightens the mood at the end of the year. I also wouldn't be afraid to show a movie. I know this can be controversial, but it's the end of the year. Unless your school has some kind of school-wide activity or maybe like a festival planned, the last few days of school can actually just feel like you're there to get the federal funding. You know what I mean, you're just there. You're wondering, why are we still here? There's literally nothing to do. So if that's the case where there's nothing planned the last one, two, three days of school, just show a movie. Just have them bring their own snacks or provide them with popcorn or something like that. Let them sit on the ground and just show them a movie. So next, let's discuss how to keep your sanity in check because let's be honest, the last few months can be pretty stressful. So tip number five is don't be a martyr. It's okay to take breaks. I would schedule at least one or two personal days during this time just so that you can have some time to reset and so that you won't sit there freaking out and losing your mind. You're probably going to need some time away from certain students, if not a whole class. I remember that I did that with that one class. I had to get away from that class just for a day because they were starting to become out of control. And even though I knew that it was really unfair to do that to a substitute, I didn't want to be a mean teacher at the end of the school year and have them leave with that kind of impression of their experience with me. So taking a day off just made me a better teacher and it just really helped with the vibe in my classroom towards the end of the year. Something that you can consider, there's a three-day weekend usually for the Memorial Day weekend. 
Maybe make it a four day weekend and take that Friday off too. Plan for it now so that it doesn't creep up on you and you can have a solid lesson plan for that. If you wanna know more about lesson planning, I'll leave a link below so that you can watch the episode where I talk about how to set up a solid lesson plan. The next tip is to continue to prioritize yourself. Yes, you can get bogged down with all of the things that you need to do towards the end of the school year and just get bogged down with the stress of having to deal with these students who are just acting insane. So it's really important more than ever to prioritize your health, especially your mental and physical health and take time to disconnect. Make sure you're getting an adequate amount of sleep, you're feeding yourself well, you're moving your body, all the things that you know that you should be doing, but this is a time when the stress can make you sick. This is the time when the stress can make you want to quit, even though normally you weren't even really thinking about quitting. It's a time that can be really, really stressful. So prioritizing yourself is gonna go a long way. My next tip is to connect and commiserate with your colleagues. Normally, I don't necessarily think it's good to just have a wine fest with your colleagues because that could just lead to a lot of negativity. But this is kind of the time when it's okay because you just sometimes need to vent, right? You can try to vent to your family members and friends and they'll listen for a little bit, but I don't know about you. After a while, I kind of feel bad doing that because they don't really know what's going on. They don't really understand and they can't relate unless they're fellow educators. So lean into talking to your colleagues, if you have that kind of connection with some of them, or even if you don't, you can still in the copy room just say, oh my goodness, this is so frustrating. And it's just nice to get it out and, and talk about it with them. And then you can all share your frustrations and celebrate successes with each other, maybe bounce ideas off of each other in terms of how to keep the kids from becoming too restless. I remember one year where another colleague had some difficult students and I had some difficult students. And so we would send something with that student. It wasn't really anything that was important. We'd make up some kind of paperwork to give to the other teacher. And that would give the student time to walk over to that classroom and walk back. And a lot of times that would redirect them or have them clear their head enough to where they weren't as difficult for the next block of time. So we've covered the essentials in terms of how to prepare and how to keep your cool. And now we're gonna talk about Taming the Tempest, which is basically managing the classroom energy, especially when your students are a little restless or a lot restless. So it goes without saying that you need to plan some engaging activities. This really isn't a time for your normal lectures. The kids just, I don't care if they are in 12th grade or in second grade, it is really hard for them to handle lectures at this point in the year. I mean, if you have to do traditional lectures, that's fine. But just know that they are going to be more restless, less likely to absorb the information and will probably get into more trouble. And you have to be prepared for that. And you have to accept that. You can't actually get really mad at them about that because it's just their nature. I think it's better to plan something that's more interactive and more fun. Maybe something like what I had discussed with the Modern Classroom Project model in my previous episode in terms of having videos for whatever reason, students are more engaged with watching a video than they are listening to me. They follow the directions that I tell them via video than I tell them in person. It's kind of interesting. So maybe you just mix it up during this time so that it's not just the same old, same old. A different stimulus will get them to focus more. So this is a time for more hands-on learning. Maybe some educational games. That could be like a daily thing that you do as a warm-up. Just find ways to keep them focused and motivated. Something that is more relevant and fun for them that maybe you had been saving up all year. And this goes along with my next tip, which is to take movement breaks. If you're an elementary teacher, you already know about this. You know that you have to have the students move after a certain amount of time or else they will move without your permission. So it's better to have them move in a structured way rather than when their body just is like going to start gesticulating or whatever. So I would schedule short bursts of movement, whether it's a stretch, as I mentioned before that I did with some difficult students, sending them out on a fake errand, maybe taking a fun brain break where they get to mix up their group somehow or mix up their seating chart. With that eighth grade class, sometimes you would take a five minute walk down to the library and back just so I could provide them with time to talk, which is all they wanted to do, to get that energy out. And I tell you, when we came back from that, 
they settled beautifully and got focused. So schedule things like that for your students, especially this time of year. Now, my next tip is to really embrace and understand why students are acting this way. That class that I had, they weren't bad kids. They really weren't. They just, they were friends. And so no matter how I arranged the seats, there would be someone there for them to talk to and goof off with. Even if I put them near someone introverted, even those introverts would sometimes get into trouble because they just couldn't help it. It was just that kind of energy in the classroom. And so they became obviously even more restless at the end of the year. And I had to remember why that was happening. They were eighth graders. They were about to promote and go off to high school. And there was definitely like a nervousness and this just elevated energy, this buzz in the school, because they just knew that this was it. And some of them, their mindset was, well, this is my last hurrah, so I'm gonna go and be stupid and do things that I know I shouldn't because what are they gonna do to me? And let's be honest, what are they gonna do to them? They're gonna what, not let them promote? They probably weren't gonna promote anyway. So it didn't matter to them. And then there were other students who were really anxious and they didn't know how to get that anxiety out. And so it just came out in the form of like talking too much, not listening or not doing their work. And sometimes they were bored because let's be honest, it's the end of the year. They've worked really hard. Even if they didn't work really hard, it's been a long year for them. And so at this point, they just can't absorb anymore. Their brains are fully saturated with everything that you and their other teachers have taught them. So it's just really hard to get them to be productive. And you just have to understand that and embrace that and accept it. And finally, you have to plan for it. I'm not making excuses for them per se, but when you do understand and really plan for this, then you can minimize the amount of frustration that you're going to have because you know your students you know when that breaking point is for them, when they're going to start acting up, and you plan something for that as a preemptive strike. Maybe you just plan things where every single day there's a fun routine that they could look forward to, and they know that you're building in something fun, like a silly Kahoot. I know I keep saying Kahoot and there are other games, but you get the point. It doesn't necessarily always have to be an educational game. It could be a Kahoot about cartoon characters. It can be a Kahoot about modern slang words that they help contribute to, something like that. So that was a lot to cover. <laughs> but by following these tips and really embracing them, you really can transform the end of the school year from this horrible slog to a time when you can really celebrate and have some closure with your students. I have to say that with that particular class, we really did end on a high note and strangely enough, even though they stressed me out for the entire school year, I missed them. I was really sad to see them go. We had wrapped up that school year so well, so positively with so much energy and on a high note that they also missed me. So just remember, plan engaging activities, take care of yourself, focus on the progress that you and your students have made together and be as proactive as possible. I mean, summer break is right around the corner. Now, as I mentioned before, if you haven't figured out how to create some solid lesson plans that will make it so that your students actually accomplish something in your absence, be sure to click on this video next to get that.